Welcome, everyone, to another edition of 45 Forward, where our mission is to help you, our listeners, from Los Angeles to Long Island, plan how to age successfully, making your second half of life even better than the first. In today's show, we're going to start off with an old expression, one that we're all familiar with. There's no place like home. When I hear that phrase, I can't help but think of Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz and that scene where she says over and over, almost trance-like, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. We know what she means. Home is a place we associate with family, love, safety, a comfort zone, a place where we can be ourselves. Not surprisingly, when most Americans are asked where they want to live as they get older, they say they want to remain in the comfort of their home, where they've raised their family, where they have cherished memories. Indeed, a recent AARP survey found that more than three quarters of adults age 50 and older say they want to stay in their homes and their communities to age in place for as long as possible. And yet, many don't see that happening. They're not sure it is possible because they won't have the resources to continue living independently. Enter the National Aging in Place Council, NAIPC, NAPEC for short, I call it. In today's conversation, we'll be talking with Tara Bowman, the program director for NAPEC. Tara, who has worked in the aging services market for almost two decades, is passionate about connecting and supporting professionals serving older Americans. She will give us a broad overview of this organization, what it does, how it can help people who want to age in place. Over the years, NAPEC has grown to provide a dynamic network of 400 members who are experts in healthcare, financial services, elder law, design, home remodeling, and dozens of other fields dedicated to supporting seniors. Tara will talk about the array of valuable NAPEC resources, including virtual educational programs, seminars, events, practical tools, downloadable guides on the organization's website. And during the course of the show, in each of our segments, we're going to have the opportunity to meet some of Tara's fellow NAPEC members who will tell us a bit about their expertise and give us their perspective on aging in place. Just as we make plans to go to college and pursue a career, we need to start thinking about how to plan to age in place before we retire. And Tara will show us how NAPEC can help open the window to that plan. So with that as our goal, let's meet Tara Baldwin. Tara, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, Ron. Thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. It's a pleasure. So Tara, let's just start off by talking, give us a sense of what the organization's mission is, um, you know, what, how, what its principles are, and then a little bit about, about you too, about how you got involved in the organization. Sure, I would love to. Well, the National Aging in Place Council is a nonprofit trade association based in Washington, D.C., but we do have chapters all across the country. We have 14 active chapters, quite a few that are uh, in various stages of formation right now, and then about 400 individual members um, across the country. Our mission is really to bring together professionals and communities to champion aging in place through collaboration and education. So we've been around since uh, I believe we were officially formed in 2006. Um, in 2009, a group of individuals in Baltimore, Maryland got together and formed our very first chapter. And once that happened, it was really kind of more focused on um, growing locally and spreading the word locally. We do have a lot of still individual national members, but, um, you know, getting boots on the ground and helping individual seniors in our communities is really kind of the focus on where our future is and how we're helping people grow. Um, in 2013, we had a really big summit in Washington, D.C., which kind of really gelled our whole organization together, and that's where we created um, the, the platform of our organization, the Five Pillars of aging, which are housing, healthcare and wellness, personal finance, transportation, and social interaction. So that's where we took all five of those pillars and created the Act 3 document, Your Plan for Aging in Place, which is what we use to help people plan for aging, whether they're already seniors or if they're 45 like I am, ah. um, starting to plan the future. Well, good. You're 45 and we need to go forward. Okay. I great. am. Yes. Yeah. And how did you get involved? You know, I, um, my background was all in music business. I went to school for music business, but my father got me involved after he um, retired from work. I moved back to Florida and got into reverse mortgages with him. Oh. And at the time, there wasn't really any 
kind of valuable, credible information on reverse mortgages. So I wrote a book in 2014, oh. or sorry, 2004, called The Reverse Mortgage Handbook um, for seniors that really broke things down in a non-salesy way, hmm. um, the reverse mortgage process. So that is actually how I got into it with my dad. <laughs> right, right, right. That's fun. Yeah. And now throughout the stages, I've now I work with my husband here in Orange County, California, mm -hmm. and we provide outpatient physical and occupational therapy to patients in their homes um, through our Orange County and parts of LA County. Right. Very valuable service. I, my mom, you know, I went before she passed, she had some fall incidents and uh, physical therapy really was a, a game changer for him. So I was yeah. glad to hear about uh, physical therapy. Yeah. And, you know, fall prevention is a big thing that we talk about at the Aging in Place Council, because there are just a lot of little things that you can do to help prevent things. And I know our first guest, Karen, when she comes on, she'll talk about that a little bit, because that's really big for her. It's just, you know, being aware of where the rugs are or adding a grab bar that they don't even look like grab bars anymore. You know, they look like these beautiful decorative items that you don't have to feel like you're living in an institution. You can stay living in your home and have it just as beautiful as it always has been. Right. Well, that's a good segue because as I mentioned at the, in my introduction, we're going to have people come on on the show. And I think Karen is actually waiting on the line. Are you there, Karen Leventhal? I'm here. Hi, everybody. Nice huh? to be here. Yeah, Hi, nice, to have, <laughs> nice to have you. Hey. So listen, tell Thanks. us a little bit about Karen, how, about your, your profession and how you're involved with NAPEC. Sure. Um, my company is called Seniors Choice. We're a home accessibility company. Um, we're general contractors that specialize in aging in place remodeling, or I'd like to call it future proofing. And um, National Aging in Place Council really gave me that credibility with other customers and with, with my peers as well that I'm part of a national organization and I'm really committed to helping others in the community as well as, you know, nationally um, age in place successfully. Great. Okay. Um, and, and more specifically, what, what are some of the things that you do to, um, uh, to help people stay in their house in terms of, you know, renovations and remodeling, like as Karen, as uh, Karen, sure. Karen sort of mentioned, yeah. Sure. So bas um, basically what I do is I go in and do the first step is to do a home accessibility consultation. I do a walkthrough of the person's home starting at their entryway and uh, take all sorts of notes and pictures. And, uh, and I can even do it on video now with Zoom and stuff like that or FaceTime. Um, and I um, do an assessment of the person's house, take measurements of doorways, heights of thresholds, um, entryways, all sorts of things I'm looking at and looking at the home safety of not just the bathroom um, where a lot of companies just assess the bathroom because that is the major place people do fall, but I assess the whole entire home and then make recommendations based on that. Submit the recommendations to the, the client or their family member or whoever is the person who requested the evaluation. And then we make a plan together of how they want to go forward. It could be um, sometimes in the plan, it's like these are short-term solutions and then these are, these are possible long-term solutions. And I let them sort of guide where they need to go or where they want to go and then sort of help them along the way. Uh, one of the most common things I see is that people are sort of in denial of what they need and I help guide them into showing them you know, um, what they could possibly need in the future. And I always tell them I'm not a psychic, but based on all my experience, I could tell you that you might need this in the future. And why not do it now when it's not an emergency situation? Because when it's an emergency, it makes it even harder to get things accomplished. You're not thinking, the, you know, the person isn't thinking as rational. It's more of an emergency. So I really like to future-proof or plan ahead with people and help them successfully and safely age in place. And well, that's Karen, great to... she was a guest on one of my, we have a podcast that we feature um, our members and she was a guest last week on our podcast, just talking about some of the safety issues that she comes across. And maybe you could kind of share what your top safety issues are that you shared last week, because there are some that are so um, obvious and others that you think, oh, maybe I need to think about that as I age at 45, like in your shower with the, the bath mat, Karen. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Last week I was sharing 
So I'm 50. And uh, last week I shared that I broke down and got a bath mat. You know, one of those suction cup bath mats in the bottom of the shower or bathtub so that you don't slip and fall in the bathtub. Now, I thought I'd never need it, but lately I've been putting moisturizer on in the bath for, in the bath. And so my feet are slippery, and when I get out, I tend to, like, slip and slide a little bit. And I'm like, I've got to practice what I preach here because I'm endangering myself just by, you know, having slippery feet in the bathtub. So step number one could be putting a bath safety mat. Step number two could be adding some grab bars. And like Tara mentioned before, they have ones that are just absolutely decorative, beautiful, all different colors and styles. They have ones that are um, shower organizers that are grab bars. So I could install one of those that can help me while I'm in the shower in case I slip. So those are that's like a simple change. The bigger things that people don't think about are lighting. Lighting is a huge issue um, to help you protect yourself from falling, whether it's um, lighting that's focused downward at your feet or whether it's um, ambient lighting, just all the different types of lighting that's out there really make a difference. Whether you're approaching your home and you have automatic lighting that lights up your pathway or you have um, those solar lights that help you find the path or whether it's a light in your hallway or a night light in your bathroom, anything to make your path of travel easier and safer is super important. The other thing about fall prevention in your home, of course, is like throw rugs and having a clear path. Or if you are now using a wheelchair or a walker or some other mobility device, make sure there's that clear path with any no trip hazards, um, plugs, telephone cords, or cell phone chargers, or computers that are not, you know, there are cords that are not in your path. And lastly, um, also think about your knobs and your levers, like your doorknobs or your faucet levers. It's much easier, instead of using a knob, it's much easier if you have problems with dexterity in your hand to have installed levers, whether it's a door lever instead of the doorknob or, like I said, on a faucet having a lever. Those are, again, just some simple things you can do when you're looking at making your house safer for you to age in place. Of course, bigger items would be um, widening doors so that the walker or wheelchair can get through or converting a tub or a shower with a high threshold into one that has a no threshold or a walk-in tub if you're a bath lover. Yeah, you know, as I, as I hear you uh, mention all these things, it always occurs to me that, you know, what's good for aging seniors to prevent falls and, and uh, to, uh, you know, increase mobility are also good for everybody. I think that's what people are, you know, that that's the notion of universal design, right? Where, I was just you know, going to say think, that. That is the idea of universal design. Right, right. Talk a little bit about that. Are, are, is that catching on in the building community? Um, yes and no. Um, I think that we still have a long way to go. I think with, especially with COVID, more and more people are wanting to stay in their home. And I think people are like, huh, I now need to make my house a little more safe. I need to build maybe an accessory dwelling unit is really popular, especially in San Diego right now. Right. Um, you know, a little right. um, like casita outside your home or a little mother-in-law house um, and making it more accessible. I think it is catching on, not as, not as fast as I'd like it, of course, um, but I do think it is catching on. Yeah, I, I think it was... Um... <laughs> I think we have to get some millennials to to use some of these devices and 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 pitch for us because I think that's you know that's part of this whole notion of you know age friendly communities you know that I think that people realize that when it, what is good as you get older is really good at any age. I mean I, I know in particular um, you know and some of these devices that that you know one of the things I have a lot of trouble with these days is opening cans or opening you know the the, the lids are so tight. And some of these devices or, or even different tools that are difficult to use to, to, you know, these redesigned tools that are ergonomically designed and so, you know, supposedly for seniors, like, no, no, this is good for everybody. <laughs> this exactly. is, you know, this is helpful. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I think people carry um, like some sort of like embarrassment or shame that they need to use these tools. 
uh, or any tools to help them. And the way I always explain it to people is that this is to enhance your life and make it easier that your activities of daily living don't become your whole entire day because you're so exhausted after you take your shower or you walk from one room to another. You want to enjoy your life, keep doing the things you're doing, and these things help you enhance your life and make it easier. But again, I think it's that it, number one denial that they need it, or number two, it's that the uh, shame or embarrassment that they do need it. You mm -hmm. know, and I agree with you. If millennials got out there and started using grabbers and they were reaching <laughs> for their top shelf a can, then it would be the cool and hip thing. I think we need to do a TikTok or something about it, and yeah. you never know what could happen. That's right. We'll have to show you know a, a dramatization of them falling and like, oh, you know what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, it really exactly you know, yeah and, and and as you've mentioned that um you know i guess falls prevention is, is critical and and that's one of the things that i think is the deadliest for as you age right i mean that that's one of the, the major yeah. causes of uh of um well injury and and, and death in, in at home right absolutely falls are a huge problem and the chances of falling if you fall in once the chances of falling again increase about 50%. And so it is definitely important to do some fall prevention, whether it's, you know, of course I specialize in your home, so making your home safer, but, you know, also getting your vision checked, getting assessed by your doctor or a physical or occupational therapist like Tara has in her company, um, just to evaluate what's going on and things you can do to make yourself safer. Um, really make a difference. Of course, exercise is also super important, right. whether it's chair yoga or, you know, um, walking, whatever you can handle makes all the difference. Strength training, uh, core work, all makes a difference in your fall prevention. So and yeah, even wearing the proper shoes too, thing. right? Even the proper oh, shoes definitely. and the proper um, ambulation equipment that you have. I see some of these people with walkers that I think they've had for 35 years that just aren't safe anymore. So it's just kind of taking the whole package and looking at everything, not just the obvious things. Right, right. So of listen, course. guys. Yeah. 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 So so we're going to take a, a short break in in, a, in a, about in a few seconds now. But we'll be back more. Uh, hold these thoughts. And when we get back, I want to talk to you folks about you know, how people find you. You know, how do they find members? And how do you, how do you get access to these resources? PC, um, the uh, National Aging Place Council, uh, Tara Ballman and Karen Leventhal. Before the break, we were talking about various issues about how to prevent falls and how to uh, remodel your home. Uh, to, to you know, enable you to do that, as well as other things to increase your mobility. So, uh, Tara, you were talking with Karen about, you know, some of the, the resources you have on the website and how people can access that. So continue with that. Either one of you, Karen or Tara. Go ahead. Well, I know that we have a needs, that Karen has her own needs assessment that she has when she goes into homes. But as an organization, we also have the Act 3 planning guide that you can download from our website, which is ageinplace.org. But I know that Karen uses that with a lot of her customers or her senior family. So I'll, maybe I'll let you explain that a little bit, Karen. Sure. I absolutely use that document with every single family I go and assess. I provide them with the whole entire um, folder filled with resources, and that's my number one resource because I'm not only looking at their house, I'm looking at all the different um, all the different paradigms, I guess is a good word, um, all the different you know, paradigms of things we need to look at and when you're successfully aging in place. So this, the workbook, the download, is this incredible workbook that really helps you think about and assess your own home, your own life, your own finances, and sort of has that whole thing of makes you want to go, hmm, I wonder what I could do to improve it. And it actually gives you the tools to make you um, or help you improve improve those different areas that there are some weaknesses. Whether it is your finances and you need to get your financial quote unquote house in order, or whether it is, oh, I really never thought about, I might not be able to drive. What am I gonna do? What are my community resources? Or, you know, thinking about socialization. Wow, I'm pretty much a loner, so it doesn't really bother me. Or I am the social butterfly and I really need to get these things in place and make sure my friend's going to be able to pick me up and drive me, or I'm still going to be able to get to the movies or to the shows or just out to lunch with my gal pals. I just really, you know, this, this um, document or workbook 
really is all encompassing. But I do caution people. It's very, um, all encompassing. So it could be very overwhelming. Mm. So don't try to tackle the whole entire workbook at one time. Do a, you know, a chapter or so a day or in a week, because you do have to do some homework and determine what your level is of, um, competency in that area and then move forward on how you can improve that area. But it is a free download on the Age in Place website, and um, it's an amazing workbook that has invaluable tools and really makes you think about your future plan or future-proofing your life. Great. Thanks very much. Now, we're going to move on. Thanks. Thanks, You're welcome. thanks very much, Karen. Now, we have another member, um, a, a Deanne, um, who is on the line now. Uh, Deanne, you want to join us? conversation uh, oh i can barely hear her uh oh <laughs> uh, no i can't i can't let me hear. take it off of there oh, you go there yeah i have is. my headset on is yeah. that better I, that's it's better signal <laughs> go ahead go ahead let's let's t tell us a little about yourself and what do you do wow what don't i do <laughs> <laughs> So I am, yeah, Tara's going to laugh on that one. I am actually a business and personal development consultant and aging in place specialist, but the hats that I really absolutely are my passion is I am the chairperson for the City of Las Vegas Senior Citizens Advisory Board oh, and also a board member of the National Aging in Place Council. I work with the Armed Forces Chamber of Commerce, and I am just what you call a very loud voice for seniors in my community and pretty much anywhere I can. Yeah. Advocacy is so very close to my heart after working with them full time for the last 11 years. Right. Well, you know what, that, that brings me to another point, which is that, you know, we talk about aging in place and yes, we do mean in the home, but we also mean aging in community. Uh, that's what it's really about because you're connected to your community. And if you're, if, and as we found out with the pandemic, if you're just stuck in your home, that's a problem. So talk a little bit about the relationship between aging in place and aging in community. Absolutely. When you are aging in place, it's exactly as you just said, you're, you're doing it on your own, in your own home, with maybe just your small circle of neighbors, et cetera, if even that these days. But when you're doing it in community, what's really happening is you're getting leaders, you're getting agencies, you're getting advocates such as myself and everyone together to really look at solutions to the challenges and to look at, okay, in our community, what are our demographics? What are the challenges that are facing our specific demographic of seniors? And then we also have to chunk it down into what we call entry-level seniors, uh -huh. right, which is the 50s, <laughs> versus right. those that, of course, are you know going into the latter stages of seniors because there's different needs between those two sectors. So it's really about making sure that we're covering the gaps in services that will allow them to be able to age in place. What are those needs? And that's something that we're doing from the city standpoint is we're looking at the gaps in services, which of course became very prevalent during the pandemic, right? Right. You know, it was very obvious what those things were. So that's what we're doing is really trying to get people involved. We're even in doing things such as uh, with my board, we're giving out awards to people that went above and beyond to make sure that seniors didn't fall into homelessness during mm. this whole thing. Mm. All because of one incident, right? It takes one health incident and it can completely change the way you're aging in place. Right, right. I, I like that term, entry level seniors. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I'm I'm uh, I, I'm already well past the entryway. So, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, it it is um, it, it's a tremendous span. I mean, you know, you can be you jo you can join ARP at fifty, right? But then, you know, certain mm -hmm. government agencies at, at sixty, you're a senior, and then you. Social Security is 65 and then, you know, uh, and, and beyond. But I think that, and, and I think a lot of people, you know, I, I know that in my area here, you're, you're in the, in Nevada, uh, here in my area here, it's like, I think that, you know, among many fellow baby boomers, we don't even like to acknowledge that we're seniors, you know, and that the, the average age, uh, I think locally here, of uh, people who go into uh, senior centers is 83. 
So, you know, and they're vital, they're vital. So um, I think from a policy perspective, you're absolutely right that it, it needs to be, you know, something people really look at. And I think, I think we're sort of an overlooked demographic. Um, and how, how do you look at that issue? How do you get, and how do you get people to look at seniors as part of a continuum, not just like you're young and then you're old? I mean, that's, we seem to have that demarcation. It's like not true. Absolutely. And I mean, you just hit it right on the head. It, it is, it, it's a lot of denial, first mm -hmm. of all, denial and fear. So you have denial for those that are in those senior years. And by the way, I am entry level. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I am in the 50s. And that's why I really am targeting how to bridge that gap that you're speaking of, because then you've also got the younger ones who kind of push aside anything senior because of fear. We, that's one of our biggest fears. When you look at the top 10 fears in the mindset, one of those is the fear of aging as mm -hmm. well as the fear of death, of course. So that's why it's really about education. And it's really about showing the, the younger generation that it can be really fun to be a senior, right? Especially when you're retired, you, your time is your own. You can do things you truly love, whether that's traveling, whether that's just getting more involved in community and, and having different groups. And yes, our senior centers in, in our Southern Nevada area, you know, we have a different demographic. And mm -hmm. here in our area, we have 48% of our demographics are 50 and over. Wow. And, you know, that's a big demographic. And for me, when I saw that there were not a lot of things being done for this demographic, they were being done individually. And not necessarily from a city standpoint. That's when I kind of dipped my toe in the water and got pulled in <laughs> very full time. But I love it because I think it's really, and I do believe one of your former uh, podcasts in April was about this too, is bridging those generations. Right. Because we really need to get that stigma out about seniors. And especially when you look at the demographics of the nation as a whole. You know, you look at how many are now 60 and above, and it's really going to take community effort to get this education, to get the interaction, and to get past that denial and fear and just start living again. There's nothing wrong with having health conditions and still aging nicely. It, it happens, and it's not even age. I mean, I work with a lot of people that are in, you know, disabilities as well. Mm -hmm. because they get kind of lumped in, you know, with that aging. And it's amazing to me how we just really need to look at our programming, our education, a little more full spectrum. And to once again, get that stigma out because, I mean, I've worked with seniors on so many different levels. My husband entertains them. I educate them. I advocate for them. And I have to tell you, I have got more wisdom than I could ever imagine in doing all the things that I've been doing. And right. it really is a true pleasure if people would just get in there and just do, just try it. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that, uh, you know, there are, there are a number of, you know, um, unfortunate myths. I think one is that uh, as you go on in life, it's, it's sort of like a, a mountain climb. You know, you're one of my previous guests, he was in that, used this metaphor. You're, you're climbing up a mountain and you're going higher and higher and higher. And then you get to the top and then the rest of it is in decline. And, you know, and that's not the case, you know, you can climb for a long time. So you might need a walking stick. Okay. But I think that there are, there are things that we overlook in terms of, of the capability of, of, um, you know, older people in, in our society. And I think we, you know, we, we tend to think of them as takers rather than givers, you know, and I think that that's, that, that's one of the things that has been just, you know, statistically disproven economically, I think AARP did a whole study called the over 50 economy about how much seniors actually contribute to the economy, literally, not just in terms of, you know, uh, their volunteering, they actually are contributors, you know, economically. So I think that's a, that's a real mm -hmm. issue. I think you've tackled and I think important. Um, are, are there anything specifically in your area that you've been, you particularly want to, you know, uplift, uh, you know, for our listeners in terms of things that you've done or changes that you've made or, or policies that you were able to get through? Well, one of the first things is we now have a senior department at City Hall. That's mm. something we did not have. We had concentration on veterans, 
which would include some of the seniors. And we have a very active senior board. When I first got involved four years ago, they weren't even meeting and they hadn't met for a year. So nothing was being addressed. And a lot of different things are happening uh, from within City Hall where there's a lot of awareness. And now we're doing a lot of events that are geared towards them and bringing the community together, right. which is, it's, it's really the key. And, you know, I, I do want to piggyback on, you know, when you said what they have to contribute. Mm -hmm. Up until this last year, because it was very different during the pandemic. So let's say prior to the pandemic, when we looked at our numbers, what they really contributed in is they were the ones voting. Ah. They were the majority that were voting. That's huge when you look at that, because, you know, when you look at policy change, people have to get out to be able to help that change. And this is not a, a pro vote thing. This is just saying we need to look at those numbers, the facts and the data so that we can see how we can contribute more. But yes, I think my heart is filled with joy because we do have a senior department and a lot more focus on seniors and a lot more bringing people together rather than working in silos. Right. That was one of the biggest challenges that I saw was this silo thing. And then nobody really knows what the gaps are because nobody's really communicating. Right. So seeing the communication that has happened through all this has been uh, very key key yeah. to moving forward and key to taking their wisdom. And just one last thought on that is if technology was to fall to the wayside, satellite, satellites went down, whatever have you, who do you think would know how to do life? <laughs> <laughs> it would be the seniors because there's so many of us now that rely on technology, right? So that's just something I like to remind people. <laughs> they have that wisdom if everything was to, you know, have a day off, so to speak. I say that because we had one of those here where some things went down and I laughed because my seniors did fine. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I, I think we're living in a, an interesting time of, you know, communication transition, you know, where, um, mm -hmm. you know, when people, you know, so people say, well, you know, something important happens in the community. So how do we communicate with seniors? And, and I say, well, you can email, you can do, you know, um, Zoom and so forth. And some people say, well, uh, you know, seniors, they don't, you know, they don't use that technology. And I think that's slowly and sometimes quickly fading away because I think a lot of seniors are our age are fully versatile in technology. Um, but, but, and even those who, who are versatile, you have to basically, you know, have many, many channels because people have different preferences. I mean, I know that, you know, my kids can use Zoom, but they don't, you know, they use um, Snapchat, you know, or some, yeah. Some people I, I know respond to text. Some people don't respond to text. Some people say I do. I do email. I don't. I don't do Zoom. So you know, I think that basically we need to you know just be realistic and know that in order to communicate and break down the silos, we got to bite the bullet and really you know use as many channels as we can you know to get across as many demographics and don't, don't necessarily separate them by generations or by age. Because, you know, they're, they're, as I said, there are many different uh, preferences in, in different generations. So I think we need to do that. Terry, you have anything else? Anything else, Terry, you wanted to add to that? Well, I'm just really excited. You can see why I'm excited to have Deanne as a part of our organization and on our board and really spearheading this Las Vegas chapter. We're, um, well, Southern Nevada chapter, we're calling it. June 20th is going to be our actual kickoff meeting there in Las Vegas, um, hopefully at the City Hall if there's anyone there locally that wants to join us. But maybe, Deanne, you can just talk a little bit about um, how you kind of started working with the governments, because I know you get asked that question a lot. You're so heavily involved there and they rely on you and you're a trusted source how did you become that source although i think we only have a minute till break so you might have to squeeze it in <laughs> yeah. we'll start it off and we can hold it until i'm on the other side of the break too so go ahead <laughs> well basically i went to a coffee with my councilman uh he's been councilman over my area for uh he's already termed out coming up and so I just wanted to go see what was going on, ask what we were doing for seniors because of my advocacy heart and the mayor was there. So I asked her uh, why the board hadn't been getting together and just, you know, some very candid questions. And of course I was voluntold. <laughs> <laughs> I was told, why don't you get on and change that? And we were in an election year, so it got kind of tabled for a few months, which was fine for me because I needed to kind of uh, sit and let it resonate with me on what that would mean. 
uh, as far as time-wise, et cetera. And then my councilman, his office ended up calling me, I think about four months later, and they said, we want you to come in under, you know, the ward. And then the next thing you know, I was sworn in and was really just trying to get people back to these meetings and really trying to get people to understand that if we don't show up to a meeting, what does that look like to even have this board? Right. So right. I just kind of came in, put my experience out there and just started going. Right. Okay. Well, let's, let's just, let's take a, uh, a pause and I'll, we'll be back with much more for you guys. We just, we're going to take a quick break. Um, we'll be back in two minutes. So don't go anywhere, folks. We have a, a lot to talk about still in our last segment. So welcome everybody back to 45 Forward. We're speaking here with Tara Ballman and uh, uh, one of her colleagues uh, from the NAIPC. Um, uh, Dia, you were talking when we, when we uh, yeah. la last uh, were speaking. Uh, about how you got involved. Well, why don't you uh, finish up your story about how you got engaged with policymaking in, the, in your local area, which is uh, Las Vegas area? Yes, yeah, so to continue, I basically, when I got sworn in and onto the board, the first step was making sure that we got our meetings active again mm -hmm. and getting everybody acquainted and just really starting to get out there, getting to know the people in each of their wards because we are, you know, set up in six different wards. And that way you start to find out the needs of your individual side of town because it still can be different even within a county. And that way we can find out what those needs are, what those challenges are. And that's exactly what everyone started doing. And then starting getting more involved in the events uh, you know, whether that means showing up at the city table and just listening. That's the biggest thing to do when it comes to advocacy in, in my world is listening, listening to what they're telling you and then finding those nuggets of what is the gaps that they're not getting. What are they not getting educated on and why are they getting that information when, you know, I'm out there, I see it everywhere, but they're not. And that goes back to the communication uh, styles like you had spoke of, which are very key to find out what their communication style is. And so it was really just about getting everybody active again right. and getting education out there. And that's what we've done. And then we will advise if it's something that is of, you know, a major value, then we will be on the city's agenda. Right. But for most things, we tend to be able just to email them out to council and the mayor so that we can get them addressed. Right, right. And right now, we're obviously in a completely different territory after the pandemic to really get back out there now that we can and find out their stories and what happened so that we can make sure there is never a repeat of that again. Right, right. Now, speaking of listening to folks, I, we have another uh, an APEC member, Scott Fulton, who I'd like to bring in. Uh, to bring in a, a third perspective on this uh, last segment, Scott, are you are you on the line? I am. Good to be here, Scott. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and uh, where you're from. Um, I'm from many places. Uh, from <laughs> Canada originally, so if you pick up a Canadian accent, that's where uh, that's coming from. Okay, uh, home, okay. Home for me is in is in northern Delaware, just west of Philadelphia. Um. Uh, I wear a few hats, but I think for the purposes of today's call, it's really around uh, aging in place um, in terms of the front end design of aging in place for those who are proactive minded and, and in their early retirement planning, they're looking forward for the next 25 years saying, I, I want to take care of everything now. and What are the things that I should be doing? So um, most of my work in that area is centered around consulting and just trying to be a thought partner for people. To uh, to give them the best opportunities for a for a long and enjoyable uh, trip in their home. Yeah. So, what about your specific um, you know line of work? You, you as uh, you know, you're president of home home mediations. Is that right? That, that's right. Yeah. That that's my consulting company, mm -hmm. um, the design company. We used to we used to actually do aging place remodeling. We've really just got focused on the design work. Uh, okay. In 2019. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I'm also a teacher at the University of Delaware, um, lifelong learning uh, around ah. longevity and health. So that's part of it. And then um, in chair of the National Aging in Place Council as well. So everyone who I think you've been speaking with, uh, part of our team. I see. So you're the chair. Okay. 
He's the head honcho, the main man around here. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, so what are your goals for the, the organization overall, Scott? What would you like to see uh, in the next uh, several years? I, I think the biggest area where we're looking to right now is, is really improve our outreach mm -hmm. um, and get connected with more communities. It's a, um, it's really, you know, we've, we've, We've got, a, I think, a really strong legacy that we've built up over the years since it's been started. And it's uh, clearly at a point right now, particularly given coming out of the pandemic, there's a, a lot more uh, realization of the value of aging in place and the importance of doing some planning well. And we've got a, a just a tremendous team uh, of professionals across the country. Um, and so really building that awareness now and, and trying to help help grow that community of, of professionals really in a number of communities um, that today are, are kind of fragmented. So really we work to bring them together and really put teams together in communities to, to really serve clients more effectively than, than anyone can do on their own. Right. No, I, I, I believe looking at your website, there are about 14 or 15 chapters. Is that right? We have 14 active chapters yeah. right now. Yes. Okay. Okay. And, and, so that's that's so you guys are active among yourselves i think you said about 400 members tara um but how do people find you scott i mean so um you know how does the consumer find you and and, and make use of your resources they come to us through a number of avenues um, mm -hmm. the national aging place council website is a um, is a very popular place it serves both consumers who, who come looking for information about aging in place. It's uh, got a lot of resource content there. Um, and it's also a place where if they're looking for a particular service, they can search uh, you know, for say an elder law attorney or a relocation specialist. They can go through and find those services on our website and uh, put in their, their zip code and, and get a list of who the members are in their area. So it's really a, uh, a powerful tool, both for consumers, but also for professionals in the areas uh, where, um, where consumers can find them very easily. And what's the website, Scott? What's... Um, so, so Tara, why don't you read it off so I it's don't do the wrong one? Sure. The, yeah. the consumer facing website is agentplace.org. Right. And, and those for professionals uh, is naipc.memberclicks.net is where our resources are held for professionals. Right, right. But basically agentplace.org is the one that's easy to remember and it's for <laughs> the good. Yes. And that's where our downloadable guides are. We have that act three planning template that we were speaking um, to Karen about. And then we also have a cost of aging booklet that's on there that really breaks down each pillar and um, goes into a little more detail about individual pillars right and you have educational program you have stuff on youtube as well right we do we have a lot of new things that have come up um, in the last year and change we have a youtube channel now where every single program that we have is up there um, whether it is a professional uh, development series for us uh, deanne that was just on is going to do the mindset of seniors so she does that but we also have educational sessions like hidden gems of aging where we talk about products and services um, that help seniors age in place so uh, it's exciting to see our YouTube channel growing. Great, great. Now, Scott, back to you. I mean, so you you teach courses in uh, longevity and uh, eight and uh, aging place. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. And and, and uh, how do your students react to that? I can imagine some of the younger students are like, "What? What do you mean get old? You know, do they have any do they have any vision of what it's like to be to get older and what and what they look forward to when they get older?" What's their no. image of aging? <laughs> None of us, it's one of the hardest things to do, right? The, yeah. I tell people there's, there's only one certain thing in life, and that will be an end of life. Um, and next to that is late life, which is really hard to imagine. It's, it's hard to imagine at any age what life will be like 10 years from today. We always assume it's going to be the same. And unfortunately, when we look at aging in place, that's probably the biggest mistake people make is, they just assume life will be the same. Right. Um, so what we really try to do is encourage people to to look to look to people ten and twenty years their senior, and and just see what challenges and what 
know, who are the ones that are making the best of the opportunities that they have and how are they making that happen? And it's, uh, it's not any one thing. It's a whole series of little things and little choices that we make over the course of every day that, uh, that adds up. I, I kind of look at a, the way we think about putting money in the bank, right? We put a, a little bit into our savings account every day and that little bit doesn't seem like very much and it doesn't seem that important. But when you start to look at it over 10 and 20 and 30 years, suddenly it ends up being quite a, quite a significant amount. And the same thing happens whether we're talking about health and longevity or whether we're talking about being prepared for aging in place. The, um, I think the, everyone who works uh, in our field would tell you without, without, uh, uh, any delay at all is that people leave it far too late, right? And mm-hmm. so as a result, they don't end up with the, the choices they, they they clearly would have wanted and probably deserved. But um, but the later you leave it, the, the choices just slip away. So we really try to encourage people to get engaged early, understand what the opportunities are. And it's really, that's the way that you get successful at aging in place. That's the way you live uh, healthy longer and they really extend health span. So the two and we think about aging in place as one of the components of living a long, healthy life, right? It's the home environmental aspect that you're right. taking care of with, uh, with aging in place. That's they all dovetail together very nicely. Yeah, it's tough. I know. I, I, when I even when you talk to financial planners and, and, and you know all about this, is that people? It, it's difficult to to, to project ahead. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cultural. Uh, dissuasion to that, you know, it's consumed now. And um, I think people have what I call uh, it sort of facetiously PDD, you know, planning deficit disorder. I mean, we really, <laughs> we, we, we plan more for our vacations than for our retirement. And I think that's a really key issue right. that you're trying it, you know, it's, and I think you, you have to be realistic, like, well, I'll just keep, keep going forward, keep, you know, as you said, one step at a time, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. Um, uh, are there, you know, any uh, any ways in which your your organization is reaching out uh, beyond, um, you know, trying to um, get your members to be more involved? Uh, any any sort of initiatives you have that going on to approach um, uh, people uh, on a you know policy level? Um, I think it's mainly around again around building awareness. It, it's an area mm-hmm. of tremendous information deficit. Right. Right. It's a it can, right there. There's a you know, I would say there's a, a perception when you say aging place. We think that's like like we think about it like assisted living. Right. Right. That's that's kind of the association people have. And and that's that kind of says why they have the difficulties of success that they probably um, you know, experience as a result. It's a it's really trying to get people in in contact and connection with what's again, what it can be. And so show, show examples of people and lifestyles that are successful. Right. And so right. really, I think everybody, right. That, that's a message that we put out. It's, um, you know, whenever we talk uh, with clients, but it's, I think it's more a one-on-one experience and, and really around the, the messaging is to me, I think it's a it's message of opportunity. Right. Right. Um, and it's yeah. there for the taking. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, I, I I did get a little bit of your Canadian background with the, your out at the end there, <laughs> so <laughs> it just snuck in there, out Scott. Out and about. Those are the out two words about, that, right. that, that get me uh, get me uh, marked very quickly. So. Right. Right. Well, I, I'm sorry this hour has gone very quickly, and we uh, I just want to spend a couple minutes thanking uh, you, Scott and Tara, and all your other guests uh, for a terrific conversation um, and helping us fulfill the vision of. Uh, no place like home. Um, there's much more to talk about. I'm sure we'll have you guys back for another show. Um, Tara, if people have questions for you or Scott, what's the best way to contact you or Scott? If you, either you have different emails or what's the best way to contact you? Well, you can always reach us through ageinplace.org. Uh, there's a box to fill out there. Scott and I are both really, really active on LinkedIn. So that's okay. probably the easiest way to reach us both. Or TaraBallman.com. You can uh, go to my website. Okay. And you, Scott? Yeah. Yeah. Again, I would I would generally point people to website, and if they reach out, uh, anyone will find me through the website. Um, 
and that, that's probably where I'd point people to. It's uh, come into agentplace.org and that, uh, that they will find me. Great. Great. Okay. Well, look, folks, um, you know, if, uh, if you missed today's show with, with Tara and her colleagues, um, you can still listen to it as a podcast just by going on voiceamerica.com and going to my website and to my show site, um, 45 Forward, or on my website, roboresources.com. And finally, be sure to join me next week, 12 noon uh, Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for another conversation with Patricia King as we talk about her life of reinvention at a time when her career shifted from being a business consultant to a his historical mystery novelist. It's a great, it's gonna a great show. Don't miss it. So until then, keep moving forward, 45 forward.